Welcome to Redbird Buzz. I'm John Twork from University Marketing and Communications. Our guest today loved sports from a young age, but grew up during a time when it wasn't socially acceptable for girls and women to play competitively. Unsatisfied with the status quo, they devoted their careers and lives to rewriting the narrative of collegiate women's athletics. Dr. Jill Hutchison is a Women's Basketball Hall of Famer and a member of the Illinois State Athletics Percy Hall of Fame. She spent 28 seasons as the head women's basketball coach at ISU, was a four-time national president of the Women's Basketball Coaches Association, and is credited for influencing nationwide growth of the women's game. Dr. Linda Herman is an American Volleyball Coaches Association Hall of Famer and an ISU Athletics Percy Hall of Famer, who spent two decades as ISU's Senior Associate Director of Athletics and Senior Women's Administrator, following seven seasons as ISU's head volleyball coach. Hutchison and Herman both played essential roles at Illinois State and on the national level, advocating for gender equity in college sports and advancing women's athletics in the wake of Title IX, which was signed into law 50 years ago. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Jill Hutchison and Dr. Linda Herman to Redbird Buzz from Redbird Arena. Jill and Linda, what's the word, Redbirds? Uh, we're in the midst of a year-long celebration of the 50th anniversary of the adoption of Title IX, which culminates with a celebratory weekend of events on campus June 24th through the 26th. Jill, can you tell us a little bit more about what's being planned for that weekend? Absolutely, John. We're excited about it. We're hoping to bring back as many former female student athletes as we possibly can. And the weekend will kick off with a reception Friday night in Redbird Arena. Um, more than anything, a socialization time for people to get together with their teammates. Then Saturday, we will have a leadership seminar um, with three of our former student athletes as facilitators and a keynote presentation by President Kinsey. Then that afternoon, we'll have what we call team time. They can go play golf. They can play cornhole. They can go play racquetball or whatever. Um, and then that night, we'll have a culminating banquet with many of our student athletes presenting and Dr. Kinsey again with final comments. Looking forward to that. And We'll uh, share a link as to how folks can register for that uh, within the description of this podcast. I want to talk about each of you who have played a profound role in the growth of women's athletics here at Illinois State and across the country. Jill, starting with you, uh, I want to hear your story about how you developed a love for sports during a time when it wasn't widely socially acceptable for girls to play competitive sports. And, and how did you uh, end up at Illinois State? It's been a, an interesting journey, John. I uh, was an Army brat, and uh, I can remember when I was in, like, seventh grade, all we did in P.E. class was March, and I just hated it. We were fortunate to get transferred to Albuquerque, New Mexico, and the P.E. teacher there had an extensive program in what we called extramurals, which would be sports <clears throat> days that most people don't understand in these days. Mm -hmm. A sports day would bring teams from several schools together at one site. We'd play four or five contests. We'd officiate when we weren't playing. We'd coach ourselves. Anyway, it was a great experience. And after I went to college at New Mexico, um, my, my PE teacher had been a graduate of Illinois State. And she had encouraged me to come here. And they had the equipment I wanted to do my <clears throat> master's thesis. So I came to ISU, and I couldn't have been happier with my decision. And Linda, same question to you. Uh, during a time when it wasn't socially acceptable for girls to, to really be involved in competitive sports, what drove your passion, and, and how did you end up here? Yeah, it's a fun question. Um, <laughs> and Jill and I are the same era. But, you know, our backgrounds are a little different because <clears throat> she traveled all over the world, and I grew up in the country. Mm -hmm. So I'm a little country girl. But my very I, – I love sports. I think I was born that way. Um, but my dad was a little league coach. <clears throat> and at that time, there was no organized sports 
that you would um, recognize today, like youth sports and structured sports. So everything was um, what there was ASA softball, but that wasn't until you would get a little older. My dad was a little league coach, and I wanted to play baseball, and that's all I knew. So he let me play on his team. And my very first experience was um, we go to the county tournament, and all of a sudden I wasn't allowed to play. And the little league rule book says no girls. Well, that was my first experience with like, oh my gosh, this just may not, why is this not, just not right? Um, that, that was a time you didn't sue to have a chance to play, so you just accepted it. But deep down in my heart, I always thought, God, it's just not right. And so, but you're still driven to want to play. And so I, I took every avenue that I could. In high school, we had GAA, which is Girls Athletic Association. It's a little bit like what Jill talked about play days, sports days, but you would go to another gym and play with different teams, but they'd have to mix you up. You never played Valparaiso High School against Chesterton. So there was no competition. But I think the other thing that struck me is that socially, I think Jill and I would both say this, at that time socially, before Title IX and before it was socially acceptable, we were called tomboys. Mm -hmm. And I would have loved to have been able to have been called a student athlete. So... Um, you grew through that and you went through that cultural change and we lived it and now we've watched it and um, it's just a wonderful opportunity to see what the difference of Title IX made and in getting into sports. So yeah, it took me. But I would say this, you know, the only way that you could follow sports and Jill and I could was to be a physical education teacher. We were pigeonholed to be nurses, secretaries, teachers. So we didn't have all those avenues to the professions that we do today. So my, my approach was, my avenue was to be a physical education teacher. Never dreamt of being a coach and administrator. And that's how you ended up at Illinois State, right? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, um, I'd already taught high school, but um, I wanted to come over here and do my master's. And uh, maybe we can talk about that as we go along. But sure. th- that 1972, when I came over here as a graduate assistant, changed my destiny. And as it turns out, there were women and girls who were wanting to play sports decades before uh, the two of you. And and it was happening to an extent here at Illinois State. Jill, you're, along with being a Hall of Fame coach, you you have a lot of titles. But kind of women's athletics historian here at Illinois State is one that I I would say as well. And and there's there's a really significant history here at Illinois State tied to the physical education program. Can you talk about how far back that goes and how significant it is? Yeah, I've always wondered how we got where we were. And so I, I tried to study it, especially on our campus. And we could trace women's sports at ISU clear back to 1898 when they had, um, there were like sororities, but they're academic sororities and they would play each other in basketball. Mm. And it was within, what was it, a year after Naismith designed the game wow. and it showed up here on our campus. And we've got pictures in, in yearbooks of gals playing in their bloomers and stuff. <laughs> if you took it through the 20s and 30s, field hockey was super popular and they had a WAA organization back then like Linda referred to in the high schools where they would um, they would play like the alums against the the current athletes or even the faculty against the current team but I mean that was it it was like two or three games a season probably and then in the in the 30s in in early 40s maybe it was like um, there was this this aura over physical education that it should not be competitive, that it wasn't ladylike, and it it forced everything into calisthenics, marching, Mm -hmm. and those kinds of things. In 1948, I think it was, 45, a lady named Esther French came to campus, and she was from Iowa. She had played, apparently, you know, basketball in Iowa, and she brought that love with her. She's the one that started the sports day programs on campus here, and people even in the 40s talk about those experiences. They lasted well into the late 60s when we continued to have sports days and events, and it wasn't until late, like 68, 69, 70, when we started really competing with different schools. 
and had opportunities for intercollegiate competition. But through those sports days, that, that was creating physical education teachers who were going to places like right. New Mexico, where <laughs> yeah, Jill yeah. Hutchison was a yeah. student in, in a high school class, and inspiring young girls to, to know that, hey, I, I can have a future in, in sports, uh, even if that is as a physical education teacher, right? With, without a doubt. And actually, the high school IHSA program was really initiated by a whole lot of graduates from Illinois State University. Women who had played in those sports days and that loved the competition and loved the opportunities took that into their high school programs and we could give them thanks for how that program evolved as well as it did and as quickly as it did. Very many of the high school teachers were from Illinois State. We had 800 majors in women's physical education when I arrived here in 68. Wow. And Dr. Phoebe Scott was, was a big part of that. Um, Linda, can you talk a little bit about uh, the significance of, of some leadership? Uh, you know, you, you spent 20 years as an administrator, but there were some really significant leaders before your time, right. and Dr. Phoebe Scott and Dr. Lori Mabry. Um, what, what significant roles did those two play in, in really creating a solid foundation for women's athletics? You know, I'll when I was um, in high school and before I came over to do my master's, I think you kind of research where you want to do your master's. And I did that, and as I was researching it, uh, Illinois State was just like at the forefront of leadership, Phoebe Scott being one of them. I didn't know Esther French, obviously, but, Mm -hmm. um, and Phoebe Scott had such a national reputation, and Jill probably, she was here really under her tenure longer than I was and might be able to speak to what she did in the athletic world, but they were at the forefront of creating opportunities or providing opportunities for women to pursue their dreams. And I came over here also because of Lori Mabry, because I wanted to do my master's. And I did my master's under golf, and she was a golf instructor. But, you know, Lori was our only women's athletic director. Jill served as an interim athletic director, and I certainly have done that too. But those those people were um, nationally recognized. I mean, if you look at Lori, she went to Congress Mm -hmm. to actually testify on behalf of Title IX. Um, she was supportive of creating opportunities and letting, like Jill, run the first women's national basketball championship here. So um, because they let us pursue our dreams and they had that competitive spirit, um, I think we all are cherish the fact that we've stood on the shoulders of leaders like Phoebe Scott and Lori Mabry. Um, and they just they did so much in just terms. Of, and, they, and Lori was an AIW national um, leader and president. So, and then we might not have time to talk about AIW and NCAA, but she certainly was a, a president of a national association that governed women's sports. So, major. Yeah, and AIAW standing for the Association for Intercollegiate Athletics for Women, right. um, the predecessor to the NCAA before uh, it, women's athletics merged with men's, um, and, and the AIAW uh, College Basketball National Championship was held here at Illinois State in March of 1972, just mm-hmm. a few months before Title IX was passed. Yeah. Uh, just before that, the Redbird softball team participated in the 1969 College World Series, yeah. which was the, was the first ever. Melinda Fisher was a freshman on that team. Jill, you were uh, a, a graduate assistant right. coach. Uh, and then right after that, uh, Illinois State hosted the uh, first commission on intercollegiate athletics for women national swimming and diving championship in 1970 so some major events that illinois state uh, women's athletics played a role in jill can you talk about you you were part of all three of those um what was the the significance of all those they were huge yeah huge and there was also a national invitational women's basketball that's that started in 67, ISU was invited in 68 and 69. Only 16 teams in the nation were invited to that. So those things, and Phoebe Scott had been president of the national organization, the Division for Girls and Women's Sport, Mm -hmm. which at the time controlled all of women's sports. She initiated the organization called CIAW, which was the Commission for Intercollegiate Athletics for Women. It was not an institutional organization like AIAW, but it was the one that sponsored all those events about which you're you're speaking. And once those were 
um, approved by CIAW, then physical educators felt comfortable sending teams to those kinds of events if they were invited. Mm. And of course, that was very selective. So I think it just showed that there was the interest, there was a trend, we were going that direction. Title IX just jump-started the rest of it. But I think the interest and the drive was already there before Title IX ever hit the scene. And all of it was part of the women's lib movement of the 60s. Yeah, and and it seems like that women's basketball tournament being held in Horton, that was a big deal, right? And And some of the uh, some of the names of, of people who played in that tournament or coached in that tournament uh, became Olympians, and oh, yeah. Um, yeah, you know Pat Summit played uh, for did. UT Martin in that in that tournament. Um, you know, just and you coached in the tournament, right? right. Uh, along with organizing it, just uh, what was that moment like mm-hmm. having all those teams in Horton Fieldhouse, and 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 it had to be the start of something huge. It was. It was. It was spectacular. It was in, yeah. in my mind, because it was the first uh, national event that required qualifying. So we ha- in the process of mm. getting to that, we had to set up all the qualification rounds. And one of the nice things about AIAW is it was set up geographically. So it was state, regional, national competition, which gave you natural rivalries, Mm -hmm. so different from conferences. And now conference, obviously, are even more um, spread out across the country. So state, if you won state, you got to go to regional. If you won regional, you got to go to national. And so qualifying and setting up the officials and finally seeing all of that come to fruition and knowing that we really, really had something special there. And you're right, there were, there were some special people in that event. Pat Summit was one of them. Teresa Grants, who had mm-hmm. been at Illinois, was mm-hmm. another. Mm-hmm. Um, she's going into the Hall of Fame this year, I think. Uh, so is uh, Mary Ann Stanley, who was the point guard at Immaculata. I mean, there were just all kinds of names we could throw out there that people would probably recognize. But it was a huge event, and we were really proud to host it in Horton Field House at ISU. And as I mentioned, it was just a few months before Title IX was officially passed. That was in June of 1972, Mm -hmm. and schools had until 1978 to comply with its athletics requirements. Uh, Jill, you were uh, a coach before, during the implementation, and after. Uh, Can you talk about what what was that experience like? It's it's striking to me. There's actually nothing in Title IX that says athletics. And so I I imagine that, uh, you know, it it, it maybe wasn't even obvious at at first that, hey, this is going to change the game, literally, right? It was an accident. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Big accident. Yeah. It it was designed for access for women to higher education, to to professional schools in particular, to doctoral programs. At the time, probably 2% of the individuals in med schools, vet schools, you know, law schools were were women. And they were denied positions in college colleges to teach because they were women. I mean, point blank, that was the reason Mm. given. So Bunny Sandler was the instigator of Title IX because she wanted to be in a uh, a doctoral program in psych. And she got uh, some help from, um, oh, Bly. Oh, Birch Bly. Birch Bly from Indiana, Indiana. who was a a senator at Mm. the time. And um, so it passed, but the sidebar was athletics. And once they realized that any any program in an educational institution that receives federal funds is affected, that had a huge impact on athletics, much to the chagrin of the, our male counterparts at the time because, you know, there was only so much money to be had, and it had to be split. It wasn't when we were getting television revenue and boosters were throwing millions of dollars into it. It was student fees predominantly mm-hmm. and things like that and, and gate revenue. So there wasn't a great desire to share. And I I don't blame them. I totally understand that concept. So going through that, I mean, back in the day in the early 70s, 
we 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 shared uniforms from one team to the next we drove station wagons and if we took we had four teams in basketball if we went to a, a game we took both two teams well that would take four station wagons there's only two coaches two kids drove the cars <laughs> we we pushed them out of many of uh snow drift yeah. snow drift yeah to say the <laughs> least and um we didn't have help with with facilities we swept the floors we set up the chairs we would put a chain link fence on the back of a car and drag a softball diamond oh, we'd boy. make the kids stand on the fence so we had more weight i mean we just did everything and you know we were so happy to have the opportunity to play. And those players would tell you it, was, it just floated their boats. It was just the funnest thing for them to have the opportunity. You didn't really resent the fact that we didn't have the same kinds of things that the men had. Um, but as we got into all of the regulations of Title IX, it became more and more apparent that there had to be more sharing and there had to be more equity. And Linda, you touched on earlier, I think, a fascinating part of Illinois State's history with Title IX, which is that Lori Mabry mm -hmm. actually testified before Congress mm -hmm. as Title IX seemed almost inevitable that it would be repealed or it was at least facing some pretty harsh criticism at the time. Can you talk a little bit more about that vital role that, that she played at that pivotal point in history? Yeah, and actually Jill testified at Congress also, so it's kind of oh, a wow. sidebar too, but yeah, um, yeah I think um, you know, and Lori, you know, I'll go back to the fact that she was a president of AIW because the real significance of that is that Title IX is passed in 1972, and then the OCR regulations really weren't effective until almost 1976. But at that time, you had to have some kind of governance organization. Well, the NCAA really didn't really want women, mm -hmm. and we can really also talk about the transition from the Missouri or the gateway conference to the valley i mean all that kind of intertwines there but you know lori um women like lori mabry were the um real pa path leaders in mm -hmm. creating the pathway to governance of women's athletics and that was the first one was the aiw which existed from 1972 to 1982. so her role on that was establishing how we were rec recruiting we didn't AIW didn't do home visits. All your recruiting was done on campus. You had tryouts. So they had some sanity, that they and they didn't really want to follow the male model of the NCAA at the time. Um, obviously, there's some the history um, unfolds as we get to 1982, and then the NCAA really absorbs um, women's athletics, mm -hmm. and we start to not have AIW championships, as Jill talked about, with state, regional, and national competitions. Now we move to the NCAA, and everything is by conference. So we move to that era, and then, um, you know, we can move forward. I don't know how far we want to go with that, and we ha how much time we have to lead to the different types of governance organizations. But, you know, back to what Jill touched on. 1972, when you have the OCR regulations, money had to come from somewhere. Yeah. And all that created some animosity, I really believe, with the men and how they looked at women. And so we had a lot of really, in my opinion, those were the tough times. Mm -hmm. They were tough because we really, they didn't want us. <laughs> and I could see why. I mean, sure. it changed their world also. So you live through those changes and then you find a way to um, come back to some commonality and you hope that uh, in for the spirit of competition that's equitable which goes all back to gender equity. And it leads perfectly into uh, you, when uh, the NCAA took over uh, control of women's athletics. Jill, you were the interim director mm -hmm. of athletics, the first uh, director of athletics under a combined men's and women's athletic program. Mm -hmm. um, and then, Linda, you became the uh, senior women's administrator, the right. uh, deputy athletic director right after that, you decided to give up a, a really successful Hall of Fame uh, yeah. volleyball coaching career. Yeah, I didn't know and, what I was doing. Well, <laughs> I, you had to know what you're getting yourself into, right? Yeah, I mean, well, I don't know, but I left the next coach a really good group of kids. That, and they were awesome. But, yeah, yeah I just I just thought, you know, I, I, I didn't grow up with volleyball. I mean, Jill grew up with basketball. I mean, she, and, I, and so for me, for I don't know, it was just one of those things that I thought, well, volleyball is not going to be my – 
total pathway. So, and I went, did my doctorate here, and I thought I, I really wanted to be able to make a, a difference, probably more than just what I could do in coaching and support people like Jill, if I could, um, and then try to support women's athletics in general, maybe not just in one sport. So, you know, it was, it was um, really something that became a blessing for me in disguise. But, you know, we moved into those roles, and then in, we moved into different eras of the Missouri Valley Conference and the Gateway Conference. So it, different types of leadership, but um, um, you had to learn to create a place for yourself almost at the seat of the table. And, and something that you and I have talked about before is that, you know, though you've certainly faced a lot of challenges and it was an uphill battle, you did find allies on campus, uh, especially in the president's office, right? Uh, Absolutely. Through, throughout history? Yeah. And uh, I mean, Jill and I have both been a part of that, but we can go all the way back to Lloyd Watkins, who was really very supportive of Jill and very supportive really of me and really informing the Gateway Collegiate Athletic Conference, which preceded the, the Missouri Valley Conference, primarily because the Missouri Valley didn't want women at the time for reasons we've all already discussed. But yeah, yeah President Lloyd Watkins, um, President David Strand um, was really the president that really had to uh, uh, initiate and um, put in place all the OCR regulations, which create, had to create scholarships for women. So he had the um, enviable task of taking <laughs> money from the men's side and moving it over to the women's side. So, um, you know, he, he, he just did that so graciously in his own way. It was amazing. But, yeah, and always, always supportive. I, I can't think of a president that really at Illinois State that has not supported women's athletics it's really been a very privilege of our institution to have that kind of leadership. So I, I'm, I just am very proud of the fact of how Illinois State has supported women's athletics throughout mm -hmm. our history. And as you reflect on, you know, it's been 50 years since, since Title IX was, was passed, and I'll ask both of you to reflect a little bit here as we wind down our conversation. Um, and Jill, I'll start with you. Uh, you know, I, how far have we come? And how far do we need to go in the next 50 years re related to women's athletics at the Good college question, level? Good question, John. Participation has increased exponentially in high school, college, and it trickled into the Olympic level and professionals. So the participation is probably the biggest single improvement in progress of Title IX. Um, I think opportunities for women in higher education have grown just as much as they have in sports. Um, and those kinds of things have been the biggest improvements as a result of Title IX. Um, are we there yet? No, we're mm -hmm. not. And we need this next generation to pick up the baton and, and carry it a little. You and I have done some, some media stuff. To me, that has become a bigger issue than it was even 10 years ago because media attention is stoking college athletics. It's paying the bills. And right now, women's sports are 5% of the national media coverage of sports. And the majority of that 5% is coming from the soccer um, national World events, the World sure. Cup, the Olympics, you know, any of their international events, and the Olympics, and gymnastics in the Olympics, and, and skating in the Olympics. Mm -hmm. And so when you take even those things out, it's even a smaller percentage. Well, I think, and I've always, this has always been my argument for years and years, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Do you promote it and then they come? Or do they come and then you can keep promoting it? And, and I think it's, it's like the baseball field. You build it and they'll come. <laughs> so, you know, I think the more we promote women's sports, the more attention they get, the more it's going to grow, the more it will become revenue producing, the more it'll pay for itself. And the more socially acceptable it will continue to grow. And I think all of those are huge parts uh, of what we've got to do in the future. There's a couple more things that I think Linda can address, but from my perspective, that's become a huge one because it's funding college athletics. Mm -hmm. 
follow the money. That's yeah. right. Linda, same question to you. How yeah. far have we come and, and where do we need to go? Well, I'll piggyback what Jill said. I mean, the participation is seismic. I mean, it's, I mean, it's, um, we've gone from like one in 27 kids playing sports in 1972. And now it's like, um, in our, even on our college campuses, it's 45 to 50%. So, um, and then to a little bit what the Jill said, you know, in terms about the media coverage and it, uh, some of our issues are pay equity, um, same job for the, I mean, same pay for the same job. But um, when Jill talks about like the visibility in the sports and the revenue, when you think about that, f- then all those sports that are giving the rev- getting the revenue turn into merchandise, mm-hmm. they turn into revenue producing, and then it turns into salaries. So if we can gain gain big strides with revenue, that changes that impacts pay equity. I mean, so you have those resources. And the thing that always hits my mind is you go back to 1972, and our leadership, Mm -hmm. leadership, um, 95% of women's sports were governed by women. Those were the athletic directors. 95% of them were women. That all changed with the NCAA. So now what do we have today? 43% of our women's women's coaches, so women's sports are coached by women, 43%. Wow. So, um, and what, what's happened with leadership? Um, if you just took the conglomerate, um, only women are only in 20% of all the p- available positions in athletic administration. So that 80% of all the positions are filled by men in athletic administration. That's a conglomerate of Division One, Two, II, and Three, and then all positions, assistants, et cetera. So leadership, to me, is um, a big issue. And how that we can go back to what Jill said, and I think I could go on with some other stats that I like to talk about, but probably don't have time. So to go back to what Jill was talking about, why are we celebrating? We're celebrating the past. We're celebrating the strides at Title IX and, and the participation opportunities. That was what it was all about. And then what do we want to do? We want to inspire our younger generation, inspire other people to talk. Title IX is not a given. I mean, it's a federal law. Mm. So are we just going to assume that it can never be changed? Um, So we hope that we inspire uh, young people to think about the past, but also to, like Jill said, take the baton, see what needs to be done, find a way, make a difference, be the change. Linda and Jill, thank you so much for your time. Can't wait to hear all about the Title IX celebration as you share uh, your your experiences and and really uh, inspire the the next generation uh, of student athletes and and other women out there and men too to 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 make a change uh, and keep the change going for Title IX. Thank Thanks, you so John. much. Thank you, John. That was Dr. Jill Hutchison and Dr. Linda Herman. For more information and to register for Illinois State's Title IX celebration scheduled for June 24th through June 26, 2022, visit GoRedbirds.com slash Title IX. And for a historical review of the Redbirds who pushed for gender equity in college athletics before and after Title IX, check out the Spring 2022 Illinois State Magazine at news.illinoisstate.edu slash publications. Thanks for listening to Redbird Buzz, and be sure to tune in next time for more stories from beyond the quad.